So this week, we're going to be covering the illusion and the systems of death, also known as linear perspective. So let's talk a little bit about the terminology. So linear perspective is a system of creating an illusion of death on a flat surface, all parallel lines, also known as orthogonals, and a painting or drawing using this system converge on a single vanishing point on the composition's horizon line. Now, what that means is like for this specific assignment, you need three key factors. You need a vanishing point, you need a horizon line, and a set of orthogonal lines that meet within the drawing. A good example would be to look at some artistical references to sort of dictate how we can look at the problems or sort of the some of the situations we can kind of see in previous paintings from history. And more specifically, the workshop of Robert Campan, the Annunciation Triptych by Robert Campan himself, which is part of a, a larger sort of series of works from this triptych that we're looking at here as an example. Rather than looking at the motifs, I would want you to sort of pay attention to the sort of the furniture in between the Archangel Gabriel and Mary. Notice how tall this table is leaning upright, right? Notice the elongation of this bench, right? And so on and so forth. All created in a sort of rational, believable sort of reality. What I want you to sort of do throughout this lecture is sort of keep your eye out for these key features, right? Of sort of identifying how we can see the problems, but also the solutions of linear perspective and how that relates to architecture, okay? For our learning objectives, we'll explore one point linear perspective and define where the vanishing point, horizon, and orthogonal lines meet within our drawing. Now, level one students, you guys are all required to only do one point linear perspective. You are not required to do level, uh, for level two or three, to do two point or three point or four point linear perspectives. Anything beyond that would be a sphere. So keep it simple. Some of the previous students work we'll start to see throughout the lecture will be posted and we'll go over some of those examples as well. We'll identify atmospheric and spatial relationships to create depth within our exterior and or interior environments. Remember that their grading criteria will be factored within the ability to identify how to create the illusion of um, depth on a two-dimensional surface. Now, for our materials needed, we have our 18 by 24 inch drawing paper pads from Strathmore, 80 pounds. Um, if you want to use newsprint, you could also do that as well. That's completely optional. You do not require to use newsprint for this assignment. We have our set of graphite pencils we're going to be using. Now notice there's a series of numbers. So HB will be the base, and then it goes up to 8B, okay? Notice that HB is the lightest, but it's also the hardest, right? 2B is a standard pencil. 4B, 6B, 7B, and 8B get darker and darker. So the higher the number of Bs, the darker it is but also becomes a lot softer. And I'll show you how to do that in order to sort of dictate what the difference is between each level B is with the graphite pencils. We have our sharpener and kneaded and white erasers as well as our 24 inch rulers. Again, keep in mind those of you who have your drawing supply kits, some of you have already picked them up from either Blix, Art and Craftsman Supply or uh, Artful Touch or even from Amazon. You could also have the option to use the smaller drawing paper pads, which is 14 by 17. So keep that in mind. Let's talk a little bit about frequently asked questions about linear perspective. Now, can we understand the process of creating geometric shapes onto our drawings and is it practical? What sort of information do we need to identify and how can we create interior and or exterior environments? This is probably one of the more common questions I, I see a lot of students of mine have where they're just typing in one point linear perspective in Google and this is what comes up. The issue lies with sort of looking at some of these images of these squares, these geometric forms, and sort of thinking about practicality. Is this practical? Is this reality, right? And the question is no, right? Because it is useful to sort of identify some of these geometric forms but it's not intuitively based off of reality. We do not live in this reality, right? We live in a sort of believable reality, right? Intuitive reality. And this is what I want you guys to sort of think about. When we're looking at art history, and specifically these larger sort of altar pieces here, using visual analysis, try to examine how each painting shows the evolution of space, value, figure, and ground. 
scale, color, and light, but also in relationship to sort of seeing the differences between the teacher, who's the master, and then the student, right? Now, Chimabui's Madonna and Throne with the Angels showcases a great sort of pictorial space, but also sort of symbolisms of biblical Christianity. We have Mary seated on her throne, holding the Christ child, you know, adorned with all of these angels on both left and right sides of the painting, but also sort of uh, having sort of these uh, four figures here representing the prophets. What I want you to sort of realize is sort of looking at the throne that Mary is sitting on. Notice this sort of elongation, the perspectival space of the throne, right? It's not sort of intuitively aligned spatially with the height of Mary, but also sort of if we were looking at the features, look at the uh, face, the facial features of Christ. He actually looks like a larger adult male that's been shrunk down. Same thing with the angels. They all look like they're sort of overlapping each other as well as the smaller figures of the prophets here on the bottom. None of it makes a believable space, from even from the garment that Mary's uh, wearing. Now, in relationship to the student, Giotto, you can kind of see here it's much more realistic, right? It's much more believable, intuitive, and specifically to sort of look at the smaller details within the throne, as well as the sort of the details around the actual altar. What I want you to get in the habit of, of sort of recognizing the differences between works of art from history, but also seeing how artists created or would have liked to create a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. Notice the throne here is much more accurate, intuitive within the scale, monumentality of the scale of Mary. It's a little bit harder to see in the image slide, but her knee is jutting forward, meaning sort of giving us that illusion that it's coming forth. The more and more we can recognize this, the more and more we can start to see the differences between this process. Now, Duccio's Annunciation of the Death of the Virgin, which is a part of the Maya style altar, which is a large tempera painting on a panel done in 1308 to 11, is a really interesting example of showcasing how these motifs are not only repeated, but also sort of the mistakes of identifying some of the objects within the painting are also really, really clear. I mean, I think Duccio is trying to make a believable three-dimensional space within the painting, but I want you guys to also see if we can start to analyze through visual analysis. Look at the case or the sort of this large chess piece that Mary's sitting on, right? But also look at the stand of the Bible, right, of the book. None of it, it's sort of aligned spatially with this sort of perspectival space of the architecture, right? They almost seem like they were collaged into the actual painting which looks problematic. And I want you to sort of see how this evolution changes between how we can look, start to identify what happens after the medieval and the Gothic periods in Europe that artists are starting to use in order to sort of cre uh, create a more accurate, believable reality. Early records of what we know of in terms of human history is sort of looking back at Pompeii, which was an ancient Roman town city near modern day Naples which was mostly destroyed and buried under 13 to 20 feet of volcanic ash in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE, common era. What we can see here from this sort of very, you know, extravagant lifestyle in Pompeii was a sort of the wealth and the, the sort of the glories of the time of Pompeii of sort of showcasing people's grandiosity, but also sort of their influences and power during these times from these frescoes. But what I want you to also sort of keep in mind is that artists, architects, you know, Renaissance artists throughout this time in Europe, specifically in Italy and in, in the north in terms of the Flemish countries, were trying to investigate how they can start to create a more believable reality. And right after the early Gothic and then the late Gothic, we have our sort of beginning periods of what we now know as the sort of birthplace of the Renaissance. And specifically, sort of looking at the baptistry of Florence. Filippo Brunelleschi, which was sort of a really interesting pioneer individual at this time, was an artist, architect, scientist, writer, philosopher, you name it, a true Renaissance genius. What he looked at was the, uh, the baptistry in Florence and realized that by looking at this space intuitively, right, and specifically, specifically in sort of the Romanesque architectural style, right? 
he saw that what's in front of him was flat. So the side of the baptistry of the building was flat. But he noticed both sides, both the left and right, get smaller. And they converge on vanishing points, on anchoring both sides. He also realized there's a horizontal line at his eye level, right? So what he did is sort of created a smaller painting that he created in this sort of diagram here. And he poked a hole through at eye level. And what he did, he mirrored a small mirror facing the painting to sort of, and also poke a hole through where he can also kind of see at his sight line, how the lines would actually add up intuitively. And I'm actually going to put this in the practice and put this into practice in the demo to so show you guys how to do that if you're curious. But really, he wanted to figure out how and which we can figure out architecturally, specifically from this Romanesque architectural building of the baptistry in Florence, that we can start to use in order to create correct perspective within our work. Now, Alberti, 15 years later, wrote and codified a book titled On Painting, written in Italian and said that we need a picture plane. And in terms of what the picture plane was, Alberti speaks on the canvas as an open window through which I see what I want to paint. Meaning that a picture plane is the actual flat surface in which the artist executes a pictorial image. In some cases, this acts merely as a transparent plane, a reference to establish the illusion of forms existing in three-dimensional space. The best way to think about this would be to look at this picture plane as a window to the physical world, to reality, right? This is what? The edges of your paper. This is the edges of your picture plane, which is the edges of your paper, but also the edges of your reference, right? He says that we need three key things. We need a vanishing point, right? We need a horizon line, and this is marked indicated in here. And this is what? at eye level. That's why we have a figure here at eye level. And lastly, we need a, orth a set of orthogonal lines. And these lines converge where? On the vanishing point. Those are the three key things we need. Now, another question comes up where a lot of students asks, what happened if I have floorboards or tiles? How can I calculate the distance between how wide my set of tiles are in the foreground? And the further along they get to the background, the smaller and denser they get. One key thing is that Alberti says, okay, and this is something for everybody to keep in mind, please keep uh, this in mind because this is optional, that you need another vanishing point off of your picture plane, which is indicated right here. And what he said is that you, ne you need another series of orthogonal lines that meet at these right intersections between each set. Oop, sorry, I'm going to skip to the next slide. Okay, and then he says you must use your ruler and make a series of horizontal lines at these intersections. What that does is sort of then dictate and calculate how correct, but also how wide and how long each floorboard or tile will be. Now I will sort of apply this in the demo to give you guys more context, but remember this is completely optional and only applies if you have floorboards or tiles. If you have concrete, if you have, uh, you know, plain floors, if you have a uh, carpet that all sort of you know is uh, secondary so keep this in mind let's look at some more examples throughout the lecture but also sort of see how artists use more emotionality within their work Andrea Mantegna's Ted Christ done in 1501 this is like tempera painting on canvas roughly around two to seven feet wide you can kind of get a range of sort of looking at the, excuse me two by two feet excuse me of the sort of scale of the painting, but also showcases the more sort of exaggeration of the sort of foreshortened angle of Christ's feet after his crucifixion, but also this elongation of the head. Masaccio's Holy Trinity, which is done in 1427, which is a fresco painting located in the Basilica Santa Maria Novella in Florence, which is sort of a Dominican church at the um, in Florence. And you see these motifs constantly repeated throughout time, but also throughout history of images of God, the father, in terms of the Christian perspective, images of Christ being crucified, Mary, his mother, and St. John. You also have the donors who actually commissioned this painting itself. And this is all sort of enveloped in sort of this more classical Greco-Roman architectural style. We have our fluted columns here. 
as well as sort of Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian um, capitals of the top of these columns with arches and then barrel vaults receding into the distance. On the bottom here, we have an inscription. What you are, I once was. What I am, you will be. This is a memento mori, which is a reminder of death. Because if we all entered the altar or sort of looked at this sort of uh, this, uh, large sort of work of uh, fresco by uh, Masaccio, we can see our eye level would be right down here, reminding us that life is short. That sort of the awareness of what we think about our afterlife is also something we have to sort of consider. And yeah. these are, again, things that we'll start to see more and more throughout history, but also sort of recognizing how do you see the clear definition of how artists are using perspective within their work. Another really great example would be to sort of look at Raphael's School of Athens, also known in terms of one of the large for, uh, frescoes of philosophy done in the High Renaissance, commissioned by Pope Julius II um, in, um, in Rome, located in Vatican City. And a part of this is sort of anchored with both the philosophical ideas, but on the opposite walls, we have theology. And on the other two opposite walls, we have poetry and justice all symbolized by allegorical figures from antiquity. And specifically from the philosophers from antiquity in the center, we both have Plato holding his book, The Timaeus, and Aristotle holding his book, The Ethics. We have other sort of, again, branching philosophers that are sort of anchoring the actual large fresco here we, in terms of Pythagoras on the lower right, excuse me, on the lower left. And from the lower right, we have Euclid, and then we have sort of the lower center, we have Diogenes and the sort of in the blue, Heraclitus and the purple, and so on and so forth. All of these philosophers are sort of giving us this sort of idea of how we dissect, if we put a line right through in the center, right? The philosophers of the left are sort of dealing with the more spiritual world, and you have the philosophers on the right dealing with the more sort of actual physical worlds, both anchored by Apollo, god of the sun here as the sort of niches in this large sculpture. And then we have the goddess Athena here who symbolizes war and wisdom. The more and more we can analyze the painting itself, whether if it's looking at the central figures with both Plato and Aristotle, we could also sort of symbolize what color attributes are sort of associated with each philosopher. We have Plato wearing red and purple, symbolizing fire and air whereas Aristotle is wearing blue and brown, symbolizing water and earth, also sort of separating in terms of color um, uh, color palettes, which is really fascinating. And I want you to sort of think about this in the context of sort of looking at the perspectival space, because again, Raphael sort of putting them in a very classical ancient group of Roman sort of style, but also sort of giving us ideas of what we think about in a more philosophical context in terms of Christianity. Now, if we're looking at this assignment through the lens of sort of looking at our key learning objectives, here are some of the things that I highly recommend everybody follow, okay? For one thing, we got to keep our reference simple. Now, this is one image here of a hallway that we can kind of sort of recognize, but also sort of see how in which you can identify the main six key points. So first thing we need to do is identify what? There's a horizon line. Notice here in this picture that I took, I just took this with my phone. My eye level line is right about here. And I marked it in blue. Now, second, we need to locate where the vertical line is within the drawing. And what I've done here is sort of made a line marked in yellow to indicate this is me. This is me physically in that space, okay? The next thing I will have to do with draw a series of orthogonal lines that are located above eye level. And I mark that as red. And kind of see here, all marked in red, right? And lastly, oh, second to the last, excuse me, um, I would draw orthogonal lines that are marked below eye level, so below my horizon line. So I marked in green. Notice they all go upright to the vanishing point. And notice where everything meets will be in that center in this pictorial image. But remember, my vanishing point is not always necessarily in the center. For this example, it is. Creating a set of or parallel lines that run parallel from the foreground into the background are marked in orange. Now, these lines, they don't move. They just get smaller, but they're not sort of converging on the vanishing point, right? They are parallel. And these are things that I want you to sort of keep in mind when you're looking at a reference. 
Because we're working with architecture, this is the only thing I want you guys to sort of worry about. You could use any hallway to your choosing. Now, what happens if I move slightly to my left? Look what happens. Notice I see much more of my right. I see more of this space. I see very less of these lockers, right? It's very narrow, it's tight, okay? There's no space between here, not that much. I see a lot of the floor, right? But I also see more of this wall. But notice my vertical line hasn't changed. My horizontal line hasn't, but my vertical line has. Same rules apply. Now, what happens if I actually move more to my left? This is where we I get two-point linear perspective. And how do I know this is two-point? Is because I'm standing right in front of this garbage disposal, this recycling bin. And I notice I see this corner. What I advise everyone to do is stay away from corners, okay? For one thing, I see two hallways. I see this hallway to the right, this hallway to the left. The problem is, look where the vanishing points are. They're off of my picture plane. So it is more difficult for me to see where, where, where exactly they actually physically meet within the space. What I want you to do is, again, keep it simple. Make sure to identify your vanishing point on your picture plane. Don't try to take it off of your picture plane. It gets a little bit more tricky. So I'm gonna, I want everybody to avoid this as much as possible. You wanna stay away from corners and stairs. And I'll tell you a little bit more about staying away why from stairs. Let's talk a little bit about the differences between above eye level versus below eye level lines. Now notice everything that's marked in red is what? Above eye level. Anything below eye level is marked in green. Now you can kind of see here in this sort of standard image that we have a sort of a 50-50 ratio difference, right? We can see 50% of the sky, 50% of the ground, right? So, and so on and so forth. Now, if I slightly move my head down, what happens? I see more of the four, right? And that ratio changes. So I only see what, 25% of my ceiling now and more 75% of the floor, right? And this is the question whether or not if the vanishing point or the horizon line can move, yes, right? Is the horizon line and vanishing point always in the center of your drawing? Can you move it off of the picture plane? Yes or no? This is the tricky question, right? Your vanishing point always must meet on the horizon line. It cannot meet anywhere else. It can be more to the right, more to the left, but that would mean you would also have to keep in mind where your eye level line is. How are you looking at your space, right? How are you dictating what's key? A good example of this would be to sort of looking at The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. This is a large oil tempera on plaster painting located in Milan. Now, if we're looking at this fresco, what do you notice? Look at the figures. Look where they're seated or standing. Where is the horizon line? At eye level. That would mean da Vinci was aware of that sort of pictorial space, but also the central focus is the head of Christ. So if we dissected this image as an x-ray, what do you see? You notice that all of their heads of these on the, in the painting are roughly at eye level. This would tell us that if you have figures in your image, in your reference, their heads should roughly be at eye level, okay? If a head, let's go back to the previous slide, was up here, up on the wall, that wouldn't make any logical sense unless, unless if they're flying or floating. What about down here? That also wouldn't make any sense, right? The more and more we analyze this, the more and more we can start to see where the main focus is, but also if we had figures in the space, where would their heads be? right? And even through animation, if we're looking at a, a screenshot from Spirited Away, created and, excuse me, directed by Hayao Miyazaki, what do you notice? In this train scene at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, by the way, notice Chihiro and No-Face. They're sitting next to each other. We know intuitively that Chihiro's a young little girl, but No-Face is a taller ghost, right? 
intuitively their heads are actually really close to each other on the horizon line because they're both seated, even in the figure here, right? Now, if Chihiro and Nofe sat all the way back there, notice where, where their heads would be, right over here, right? And then vice versa, closer and closer to the right. This is what I want you to keep in mind. Even through other memes of art, you can start to analyze and how you can start to see perspectival space within the work. Let's look at some more contemporary artists working with perspective. Here's Tova Qaduri, Iraqi sort of based artist working and living in Sydney, Australia, who uses a lot of process oriented work within her um, perspectival images, but also sort of looking at sort of larger buildings, but also sort of more destructive sort of concepts within the work, some more recent work that she did. Ben Toman, Washingtonian based artist working and living in DC and Philadelphia who uses more gentrified spaces, but also sort of looking at the denseness, but also the compactness of urban cities. Antonio Lopez Garcia's staircase is a great example of showcasing the emotionality, but also the sort of the layers of value that you can get within a graphite drawing in terms of perspective. Rockshell Downs, who's a living contemporary British painter who's still living and working today, who actually works directly from plain air, sets up his easels and his sort of brushes and just works from direct observation. George Tucker, who uh, the waiting room is a sort of a great example, of sort of early Americana, but also sort of life in the early 50s, the early and late 50s in terms of anxiety, but also sort of cramped public spaces. Those are sort of examples I want you to sort of think about when you're looking at re uh, references, but also sort of looking at artists from the his from history that are adopting perspective within their work. When you're selecting your orientation, this is something that I want you to keep in mind. Now, portrait orientation refers to when the frame is in the vertical display, which means the side edges are longer than the bottom and top edges. Landscape orientation refers generally to the canvas's orientation in horizontal display, which causes the image top and bottom edges to be longer than the sides. What you have to keep in mind is that your reference should be the same. So if your drawing is in portrait, your reference should be portrait. Drawing is in landscape, orientation, your reference should be in landscape orientation. Keep this in mind. You guys decide. I also want to show you guys some examples of sort of looking at students' work from previous quarters that they use throughout this assignment. Now, this is the Getty Villa located in Los Angeles, California, sort of Greco-Roman sort of museum open to the public that the student wanted to use. This is from Howl's Moving Castle. What I love about this is showcasing sort of more a more sort of intimacy of like house bathroom, but also showcasing that with perspective. This is more recently in terms of students working on campus. Another more examples here. This gives you an idea what students have created from previous years, but also sort of giving a wide range of a, uh, sort of adopting what is important, what's key, but also sort of using more values within those shadings. There's another student wanted to tackle outside of a building, which was fantastic. Image quality is not the best, but you guys get the idea. More sort of exaggerating of lights and darks. But I want everybody to keep in mind is that remember, value isn't necessarily important. It's more a sort of about your line work, your line quality. If you want to add in value, fantastic. Put it in there. You can kind of see here, this is two point linear perspective. A student wanted to use their office at home. This is more sort of, I think this was a student's um, apartment complex where right? when they walk into their door. I want everybody to have the freedom and luxury to use any reference to their choosing, but they have to document their own reference. There's another one here on campus. This was one from Swedish Hospital on the left in another apartment complex at New Dub. Now, this is something I want everybody to avoid, specifically for level one. Please avoid stairs, okay? Why? Let's look at this image on the right. You can kind of see here on the banister, that sort of converges all the way down here. Same thing with the top, on the top here. We'll go over here. There's another vanishing point over here, and so on and so forth, and another one going over this way. There's about four. Already, that's really confusing. 
I want everybody just to focus on one. So please stay away from corners and stair rails. What I love about this drawing here that you guys can see is sort of looking at the amount of texture that the student was able to capture within the work. Notice the sort of the, uh, you know, the bluish carpet on the bottom here. Look at the sort of ways of the, the shadow from each door, but also sort of the transparent glass on the top of each office door, the corkboard texture, the ceiling, even the walls. Everything was put in with an, enough attention to detail, but also sort of attention to the texture within the drawing. And lastly, I wanted to show this to everybody because also to showcase what a student has done from a skyline in San Francisco, but also show, showing an in-progress work because the work wasn't actually finished, unfortunately. What they realized is that San Francisco wasn't a sort of... Um, an ideal image to use in the context of perspective because there's a lot of hills and valleys throughout that landscape. And that was the problem. But eventually you can kind of see here, everything does would converge here, but obviously the road and the hills in San Francisco wouldn't dictate that because there were sort of uh, larger uh, steep inclines as well as sort of um, hills and valleys throughout the city. So that is the end of our lecture.